Uh, I want to say thank you to Michele and Lillian and Cornelius for sharing uh, a testimony of the significance of the, the empty tomb, the resurrection um, in your life. Thank you for your vulnerability, um, sharing uh, difficult times um, and, and sharing uh, pain and, and suffering that you've been through. And uh, it is encouraging to me, and I'm sure it is to the rest of the church, to, to hear that you find strength from the empty tomb, um, that the empty tomb provides assurance for you that God is faithful and that God will remain faithful to us even through these difficult times. It is Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, where we celebrate and we remember the empty tomb. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Take your Bible this morning and open up to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 24. And this morning, I would just like to walk through this chapter together, or not the whole chapter, but most of the chapter, and look at how the experience, uh, how several of Christ's followers experienced the resurrection. Following uh, a discussion of that, I want to give some thoughts about what the resurrection means for us in the midst of this MCO, uh, being locked inside our homes, behind the stone of MCO, if you will. We're, we're in our own tombs, it would seem at the moment, and uh, we're waiting for God to remove that stone of MCO so that we can burst forth out into a glorious day. Uh, it's just a metaphor, um, but it does feel that way, doesn't it, that we are we are locked away. Well, I think this idea of being locked away inside our homes right now might bring a, a new sense or a new understanding of the resurrection story as we read this. Uh, when we think back to Friday night where many of us gathered together uh, on Zoom and we, we read and we sang and we prayed and we, we reflected upon the death of Christ on the cross, uh, Following his death, he was taken from the cross and he was laid in a tomb. And on Saturday, nothing happened. The, the, the followers of Jesus who had put all their faith and their hope in him at that time, they were, they were in their homes. They were afraid. They were, uh, they were observing the customs and the culture of the day, but they were afraid because everything that they had hoped in had just crumbled when Christ died and was buried. And I think for many of us, as we've been hidden away in our homes for many days, but even more so yesterday, as we think about re reflecting on the cross on Friday night, and then Saturday, where would we go? What would we do? For most of us, there's nothing. We're stuck at home. And to wake up this morning to begin to celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, uh, there is a sense of expectation and joy uh, where we can identify a little bit more with the disciples in a way that we never have before because we know what it means to, to be shut away. So let's read through Luke 24. Let me pray for us before we do. Father, we thank you this morning that we can gather together, that we can read your word, that we can sing your praises, that we can share testimonies of your faithfulness to us. But above all things, Father, we are able to gather together to exalt Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We thank you for his death. We rejoice in the empty tomb. And God, we pray that this morning you would just well up with inside us greater joy, greater faith, uh, and, and greater hope uh, as, we, as we seek to be sustained and endure this time of isolation. God, would you do your work in us? In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Luke chapter 24. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. Well, when they say they, we're talking about the, the women who were there. Um, verse 2, they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. 
but when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee? that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. And they remembered his words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. Well, just pause here and reflect on what happened before we continue in the chapter. Uh, All four of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, record similar but uh, some different version of the resurrection story. The differences are small details that uh, are provided based on someone's perspective on what happened during the resurrection. Um, And and so as we look at what Luke is recording for us, uh, we can take comfort in knowing that he has this unique perspective as he's gathered uh, a lot of Uh, resources to provide this story. He's done research. It's important for us to recognize that this is the first day of the week. Friday was the day before the Sabbath. The Sabbath was Saturday. It was the seventh day of the week. It was the last day of the week, the day of rest. And so early in the morning, right, at early dawn, it says, these women went to the tomb where Jesus had been laid. I want you to just, in your mind, just try to imagine what that would be like. Early morning, well, what would you see? What would you hear? What would you smell? What would, that, what would it feel like? I mean, the sun is not yet risen. The sun is just barely bringing its light from the horizon. So it's still fairly dark outside. It's early spring. So it's still a cool crispness in the morning. Perhaps there's dew on the ground. And these ladies who had loved Jesus and trusted in him and believed him were grieving the loss of their Lord. They had prepared spices so that they could go and appropriately anoint his body for burial because in the rushed chaos of Friday, they didn't have time to to prepare his body appropriately. And yet when they get to the tomb where they had left Jesus, the stone that they expected to see covering the entrance was it was gone. It wasn't there. It had been rolled away. What type of what type of confusion must they have experienced to find something not as they expected it to be? Have you ever been there? Have you ever been at a point in life where you stumble across something and it's just not the way it's supposed to be? And you wonder, what could this mean? They walked into the tomb and expecting to find the body of Jesus. He wasn't there. And the scripture says, verse 4, they were perplexed. And as they were perplexed, all of a sudden, two guys appeared before them, right? Uh, There are these two guys standing by them in dazzling apparel. They are in an empty, dark tomb, and all of a sudden these guys in dazzling, glowing, light apparel are standing next to them, and the ladies are frightened. They bow to the ground, and, and these angels, these angels say, why are you seeking the living among the dead? I mean, what must these ladies be thinking as they hear these words? Why are you seeking the living among the dead? 
It would be like going to Tesco and, and looking for bananas in the school supply section, right? Like, why are you looking for bananas in the school supply section? Like, you, why are you in a tomb looking for someone who's alive? I mean, how confused must these women have been? Perplexed is the word Luke uses. And the angels deliver this most glorious message. He is not here. He is risen. And then they remind the ladies about how Jesus had told them that he would be raised to life. And isn't it so sweet that it says in verse 8 that these women remembered his words? They remembered. What a joyful grace that is to be able to remember the words of Jesus. When we remember the words of Jesus and apply those truths to our lives and to our experiences, it, it wells up within us a great faith and a great joy. And these women remembered his words. And so they left the tomb because there was nothing for them to do there. Why stay in this place of meant for dead people? No, no, they left the tomb to go and tell the other disciples, the other 11, this joyful news that Jesus had risen from the grave. And as they return, those who heard their tale said, well, that doesn't really seem true. It's not possible, is it? It, isn't that the response of most people when you try to tell people that Jesus rose from the grave? Most people who have no exposure to Jesus, they say, yeah, that's an interesting story. That's kind of crazy. You, you, you think this guy who was hung on a cross like a, like a thief, like a criminal, now you believe he rose again from the grave? Okay, what's wrong with you? And yet, it's true. Something inside Peter, when he heard this story, he decided that he wasn't going to just take their word for it. And he wasn't going to either just dismiss it as being impossible. Because remember, Peter had experienced a lot of things in his three years with Jesus. You know, Peter was the one who, when Jesus was walking on water, asked the Lord to let him come to him. And at Jesus' behest, Peter was able to walk on water for a few steps before he took his eyes off Jesus and began to sink in the waves. Peter had been there when Jesus calmed the seas and the storms. Jesus had been, uh, Peter had been there when Jesus fed the multitudes with just a little bit of fish and just a little bit of bread. Peter had seen Jesus do some miraculous things. In fact, it was Peter, when Jesus asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? Peter's the one who made the confession. You are the Christ, the son of the living God. So when Peter heard this story, he didn't just dismiss it, saying it's not possible. And he didn't just accept it and say, oh, okay, that's cool. No, he went to see for himself. He went to do his own investigation, and he went to the tomb. He ran to the tomb, and he stooped down, and he looked in, and he saw the, the cloths that had wrapped the body of Jesus. He saw the cloths there, but he didn't see Jesus. Jesus had risen from the grave. He was alive. He was alive. What a monumental, powerful thing that must be. And I think for everyone who is a follower of Jesus, everyone who is born again by the Spirit of God, you have had a moment in your life where the reality of the resurrection of Jesus Christ made a difference. There is a aha, eureka, I found it moment in your life where you came to the point where you realized, wait a second, all these stories that I've read, all these stories I've heard in Sunday school or in Bible studies or that the preacher shared, wait a second, it's not just a story. It's true. It really happened. There's an empty tomb. Jesus is alive. And that has brought a great sense of joy and peace and comfort to your life. In fact, it is crucial to our faith. It's the core of our faith.
We'll talk about that in a few moments. So the women found the empty tomb and they reported to the disciples. But let's continue reading in Luke. Verse 13. That very day, two of them, two of the disciples, not two of the 11, but two of the other followers of Jesus, they were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? As I was reading this week and, and preparing for this message, uh, I had a thought that I've never had before. And my thought was this, Jesus is trolling these two guys, right? Like Jesus totally knows what these guys are talking about. He totally knows why they're despondent. He totally knows why they're, why they're just, you know, in despair. And Jesus is like, yeah, what's wrong with you guys? What's going on? You know, I mean, he's ready to just lower the boom on them and let them explain every to, everything to them. He's totally trolling them. I love Jesus for this. This is great. I love it. What is it you're talking about? Let's continue reading. Verse, the middle of verse 17. They stood still looking sad. Then one of them named Cleopas answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And Jesus said to them, what things? <laughs> so funny. And they said to him, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed, and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They, they were at the tomb early this morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but, they, but him they did not see. How confused, how crazy a time this must be for those who had trusted in Jesus. They were certain that he was dead. That's why they emphasized the fact it's the third day. He's been buried for three days. They're grieving. They're confused. They're maybe a small bit of hope welling up inside them as they heard the story of these women and the testimony of Peter that the tomb is empty, and yet also maybe suspicious that someone had done something with the body. So Jesus begins to respond to what they say. Verse 25, he said to them, O oh, foolish ones, what a rebuke. I don't know about you, but that is not what I want to hear from the Lord Jesus when I get to see him. I do not want to hear, oh, foolish one. I want to believe. I want to know. I want to trust him. By his grace, we won't hear those words. But this is how he responds to them. Oh, foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. When Luke writes, beginning with Moses and the prophets, he's basically saying in all the Old Testament, Jesus began to open up the Old Testament and do biblical theology with them, explaining how everything throughout the Old Testament was pointing to Jesus. Verse 28 says, they drew near to the village to which they were going. Jesus acted as if he was going further, but they urged him strongly saying, stay with us for it is toward evening and the day is now far spent. So Jesus went in to stay with them. 
And when he was at the table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. What a glorious thing that must be because verse 31 says their eyes were opened and they recognized him. I don't know about you, but have there ever been times in your life where you're confused by circumstances and situations and you don't really understand what's going on and all of a sudden God brings a moment of clarity? Scales fall back from your eyes. Whatever it is that's confusing you, just God makes it clear. Now, take that experience and imagine what, how much more incredible this moment is when these disciples are sitting there with Jesus. Sitting with someone they believed was dead. Someone they didn't recognize until he broke bread and blessed it and gave it to them. What was it about that moment? Were, were they with him when he broke bread and fed thousands? And something in that moment triggered their eyes being opened? We don't know, but we know this. When Jesus did this, their eyes were open and they recognized him. And at that moment, he vanished from their sight. Verse 32 says, they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem and they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had, appeared, what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. What excitement it is for these two guys to go back, to go back to the other disciples and tell them what had happened. And, and now gathered in this room, the disciples are all beginning to share stories, right? They're like, this is what happened to Peter. This is what happened to the ladies. This is what happened to us. And there is joy and awe that is beginning to well up in here. And verse 36 tells us, as they were talking about these things, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be to you. Now, I think their response is appropriate given the situation. Jesus wasn't there, and all of a sudden he was there, and so what did they do? They were startled and frightened. <laughs> that would happen to me. If I'm sitting in my living room with my family and somebody just appears, I'm going to be startled and frightened, even if I know that person and love that person. And there he is. And Jesus says, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? We are a troubled people. We do have doubts and fears and worries and anxieties. And Jesus, in asking the question, is, is assuring his disciples that doubt is not necessary. We ought not doubt God. He is faithful. He fulfills his promises. He is good. We ought not doubt. We ought not be troubled. In dire circumstances, we can trust God. That God is good. That God is faithful. He may not always work out everything according to our desires, but he works out everything according to his perfect plan. And if his plan is perfect, then it is better than our desires. So it's our job to know him and trust him and follow him. Jesus says, see my hands and my feet. It is I, myself, touch me and see. A spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. See, Jesus was there. There is something about the resurrected body of Jesus, this glorified body of Jesus, flesh and bone, fully God, fully man, who died on a cross, who was buried, who also, in the same way, was risen to new life, and yet he's able to appear and disappear. 
This is beyond our comprehension. It is the glorified body of Christ. And he is proving to them, it is me, touch me, feel me, I am real, I'm here. In other gospels, he takes food and he eats. He's not a ghost. He's not just a spirit. He is as real as you and I. He said this, he showed them his hands, his feet, while they were, while they still disbelieved for joy, they were marveling and said, have you, and he said to them, have you anything to eat? And they gave him a piece of fish and he took it and he ate. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And he said to them, thus it is written that the Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the dead and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things, and behold, I am sending the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. Jesus is giving them some marching orders here. He's explaining to them not only what the scriptures have taught about himself, but what they are to do with that how they are to respond to that. Now, when we consider this story of the resurrection, there's some things that are similar to all the other uh, stories of the resurrection and the other gospels. We see described for us how the disciples reacted and interacted with the resurrection. The resurrection itself is not described. What we see described is how people responded to it. We also see that the resurrection happens to people who were not expecting it. Despite hearing Jesus teaching about this, they, it did not register in their minds and hearts. It had to be shown to them and explained to them, even by angels. We see that when the resurrection is reported to someone, at first, even those who were close to Jesus doubted. We see that Jesus appears to a variety of people individually and corporately, both male and female. And his appearance brings about an unshakable conviction in Jesus' resurrection. So what are some of the implications of these truths for us today? Well, I think there's a few things that we should think about. Number one is this. When we think about the resurrection, we need to be reminded that the resurrection of Jesus, the, the literal, physical, bodily resurrection of Jesus, is the core of our belief system. If there is no resurrection, our faith is useless. The historical true event of Jesus rising from the grave is what guarantees our hope and faith. Paul says as much in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, that if there is no resurrection, we of all people are to be most pitied. Yes, it's true the cross is central to our faith because at the cross we see Jesus laying down his life as a sacrifice for sins. Because of the sacrifice of sins that he made, we are able to receive forgiveness as a gift. But if there is no empty tomb, we have no way to know for certain that Jesus' death met the expectations of a just God. Because of the resurrection, we know that God has accepted Christ's payment for our sins. So not only do we stand before God forgiven, we are able to receive a gift of righteousness. You see, if we stand before God forgiven, we're still not acceptable to God. We need to be fully righteous. It's not just that we're wiped clean, but that we put on the righteousness of Christ. So that when God looks at one of the followers of Jesus, one of us who have been born again in Christ, we are seen as his son, as perfect as he is. The resurrection proves that Jesus overcame sin and death and the enemy. That means that there is nothing in life that 
ought to control us with fear or that ought to control us in any way other than the hope and the joy and the love that we have in Christ because of the empty tomb. Because Jesus is victorious over these things, we know we serve a victorious God, a victorious Savior. It means that we're on the right side of history. It means that this battle has already been won, even though we are experiencing ongoing battles, we know that the war is finished. Death is not final. We don't need to fear death because it's already been defeated. There's a few other things that we often don't think about in relation to the resurrection, but the fact that Jesus rose bodily gives us insights to the importance of our own bodies. You see, Jesus did not rise virtually. When Jesus appeared to the disciples there in Luke 24, in the midst of them, it wasn't a hologram. Jesus was there in flesh and blood. That's important for us to think about. I know that during this time of MCO, Many churches around the world have moved to Zoom or Facebook Live or YouTube, and, and, and we're making the best of the situation that we can. We, we're secluded in our homes so that we can demonstrate love for our neighbor so that we slow down the spread of COVID-19. And yet, this is not an ongoing, continual substitute for meeting together. This is something that we're doing in extraordinary times. Once this MCO is lifted, we will resume gathering together because that is the intent of Christ, is for us to be with each other physically in bodily presence together. Yeah, I'm, there are certainly things that we've learned uh, through this time, uh, utilizing Zoom and other uh, technological means, but um, for the church, the church exists when it gathers together. And so, just as Jesus appeared physically with the disciples, the day is coming when we will be able to leave our homes and gather together in the same place, singing songs together, shaking hands and hugging one another, touching, knowing that we are real and not a virtual church. The other thing that we ought to think about is the importance of witness. Jesus tells the disciples uh, in verse 46 that it's written that Christ should suffer and on the third day rise from the grave and that repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning in Jerusalem. And verse, verse uh, 48 says, you are witnesses of these things you realize that the faith that has been passed down from generation to generation to generation that we have received has been passed down by witnesses. The first generation of believers were eyewitnesses to Christ's resurrection. They encountered him in one way or another in his resurrected body. And their testimony, their witness has been passed down. It reverberates through history. So today we receive that message and we are now witnesses. We are witnesses because we have not seen the physical, literal, risen body of Christ. We have not encountered him in that way. But what we have encountered is the truth. And we are witnesses to how the truth has changed lives. Because there's an empty tomb, we have trust and hope that Christ is still changing lives today as people believe his message of forgiveness, as people turn their eyes to Jesus, as we sang earlier, as they look full in his wonderful face, embracing who he is. Everything in this world begins to dim in the light of his glory and grace. We're in victory. We're in a state of victory even as the battle rages on. So I want to end today with some things, uh, some thoughts that have been encouraging to me. 
the, the empty tomb has inspired lots of devotional thoughts. It's, in, it's inspired a lot of hymns and, and songs and praise choruses. Uh, it's inspired a lot of prayers. And so what I want to do is I just want to give you a sampling of some of my favorite uh, things. I have a devotional thought for, for you from John Stott. I have a prayer that was written by Puritans in the U.S. hundreds of years ago. And I want to share with you a couple of uh, verses from one of my favorite hymns. So listen to this devotional thought from John Stott. It is impossible to read the New Testament without being impressed by the atmosphere of joyful confidence which pervades it and which stands out in relief against the rather jejune religion that often passes for Christianity today. In the New Testament, there was no defeatism about the early Christians. They spoke rather of victory. For example, thanks be to God, he gives us the victory. Again, in all these things, we are more than conquerors. Once again, God always leads us in triumphal procession. And each of Christ's letters to the seven churches of Asia ends with a special promise to him who overcomes. Victory, conquest, triumph, overcoming. This was the vocabulary of those first followers of the risen Lord. For if they spoke of victory, they know they owed it to the victorious Jesus. They said so in the text, which I have so far quoted only in truncated form. What Paul actually wrote was, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. We are more than conquerors through him who loved us. And God leads us in triumphal procession in Christ. It is he who overcame. It is he who triumphed. And moreover, he did it by the cross. Because of the resurrection, it is a living Christ who bestows on us the salvation he has won for us on the cross, who enables us by his spirit not only to share in the merit of his death, but also to live in the power of his resurrection, and who promises us that on the last day we too will have resurrection bodies. Listen to this prayer from the Puritans about resurrection. O God of my exodus, great was the joy of Israel's sons when Egypt died upon the shore, far greater than the joy when the Redeemer's foe lay crushed in the dust. Jesus strides forth as the victor, conqueror of death, hell, and all opposing might. He bursts the bands of death, tramples the powers of darkness down, and lives forever. He, my gracious surety, apprehended for payment of my debt, comes forth from the prison house of the grave, free and triumphant over sin, Satan, and death. Show me herein the proof that his vicarious offering is accepted, that the claims of justice are satisfied, that the devil's scepter is shivered, and that his wrongful throne is leveled. Give me the assurance that in Christ I died, in him I rose, in his life I live, in his victory I triumph, in his ascension I shall be glorified. Adorable Redeemer, you who were lifted up uh, upon a cross, you are ascended to highest heaven. You who as man of sorrows was crowned with thorns are now as Lord of, right, uh, Lord of life wreathed with glory. Once no shame more deep than yours, no agony more bitter, no death more cruel. Now no exaltation is more high, no life more glorious, no advocate more effective. You are in the triumph car, leading the captive enemies behind you. What more could be done than thou hast already done? Your death is my life, your resurrection my peace, your ascension my hope, your prayers my comfort. And finally, I want to leave you with this hymn of victory. The hymn, Crown Him with Many Crowns, 
is one that is sung all over the world. I just want to leave you with verses 2 and 4. Crown him the Lord of life, who triumphed over the grave, and rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. His glories now we sing, who died and rose on high, who died eternal life to bring, and lives that death may die. Crown him the Lord of love, behold his hands and side, those wounds yet visible above, in beauty glorified. All hail, Redeemer, hail, for thou hast died for me. Thy praise and glory shall not fail throughout eternity. Today we celebrate the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I hope that wherever you're sitting, whether it's in the Clang Valley or it's on the other side of the world, I hope that today you are finding hope and joy as you trust in this victorious Jesus. Perhaps where you're sitting today, you're not so certain of this. Let me invite you today to trust in Christ, to trust his death for your sins, to know that he has paid it. It is complete. The payment is finished, that you can rest in his resurrection and everything that he's done for you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the resurrection. Thank you for what you've done for us in Christ, that he is lifted high, that he has been resurrected, and now he sits at your right hand. Father, thank you. Thank you that we have a victorious Savior. In Jesus' name we pray.